We paid six and a half million dollars. If you had to build what we have today, I would say well over a half a billion dollars. Today, I'm going to be joined by West Red Lake Gold, who recently acquired the Madsen Mine in a deal that legendary mining investor and entrepreneur Frank Justra called the best deal he's ever seen in his career. Please welcome Shane Williams, the president and CEO of West Red Lake Gold. Shane, it's great to see you, and thanks so much for coming back on the program today. It's great to be here, Jay. I love, I love talking to you. Okay, well, we're going to dive into the uh, West Red Lake story, obviously. Uh, lots to talk about there. Prior to jumping into that, though, I just want to get your thoughts on the gold market because, you know, we were just chatting with a mutual friend before we hopped on camera here. There's thousands of mining executives in the world. Very few have actually built a mine and far less have built multiple. You've built three. So in your tenure in this business, you know, what have you learned that, tell, that will tell you, give you any insight into the market outlook today? Yeah, so when, you know, my background is in construction and operations and building mines. And, you know, they, they take time and they take effort. And you really need to be starting when the gold market is very cyclical, as we all know. And so mining, getting their timing right with the gold market, getting projects in the same period. But if you can get the timing right and you hit the gold market, then you get the real upside. And so you need to be investing and building when the gold market is down because, you know, the gold market runs and it runs very quickly. And then you need to be in production at that time. That gives you the leverage. So it's kind of a a cyclical approach, but getting the two of them right is very important because otherwise when the gold market is down, you're trying to come into production. You know, yeah. So you really have to invest, mm. as, as the f- great investors say, you really have to invest when there's blood in the streets. Right. The market will come, but you got to take your time. And look, we've had huge interest rates over the last years, and the gold has held up very well. Go, if you're a producer today, you're making a lot of money. You're two, over 2,000, the AISCs are around 1,300. So you're making a lot of money as a gold producer. Mm. It just hasn't trickled down to the juniors, the developers, but it will. It always does. And that's where we see once the Fed start to think about pivots and pivots over time, then you will see that movement of money. And as Rick Rule used to say, there's that huge, massive amount of money into a funnel. And that's where you get the leverage of the juniors coming in as the money, the big money swings into the commodities and gold. Let me ask you a question actually on timing, because this is something I believe I'd love to know where you stand on it. I I think nobody, definitely myself, has the ability to time markets. Like I would never trust myself to do that. But what I can do is identify things that are cheap and buy those things and then sell those things when they become expensive. And so looking for undervalued hated sectors that have a history of cyclicality and then buying them when they're low. But then it's just a patient game at that point, right? Because I don't know when the market may turn, right? Would you think I'm on the mark there? Or in your career, do you think there's actually been a collection of entrepreneurs that have timed the market very effectively? Well, as you say, nobody can time the market. Just from their experience, they know that. You know, the the mind builders of the world, the Ross Beatties of the world, you know, they're patient. You know, to build a company, to build a company takes time. It takes yeah. seven to 10 years to build out a real opportunity. And as the market is cyclical, they know it will come. So they're, they're slow, methodical, they're patient builders. But at over time, you need to do that. Because if you try to time the market, it just takes so long to build a gold mine, a mining operation, a company, that you can never get the timing right. You've got to be focused on what you want to do, your values, how what you want to achieve, and, and let the market take care of itself. It always does, you know? And and that's you, where you, mentioned, you mentioned Rick Rule, and we were just chatting earlier yeah. again. He's been a shareholder of 14 of Ross Beatty's companies. All 14 eventually delivered him a 10x return, but also all 14 at one point in time were drawn down 50 to 70% from his initial uh, purchase price. And it reminds me of this quote I I heard recently, when you're making a long-term investment, you need to be prepared to look like a moron in the short term, right? And then weather that storm. Yeah, it's very similar. You bet on the jockeys, really? And so that's what happens with with these guys. They look at people who are seriously successful, and they go with those, and they know over time, they know what they're doing. They'll take their time. They'll be patient. The markets will go up and down, but they know eventually the markets will come to them. And that's, you know, that's a lot of 
mining successful executives that's what they do they don't worry about the market they know that by building value slow methodical working through the, the times the ups and the downs but eventually they will get there the yeah. market will reward success yeah and success begets success that's why winners yeah, tend to exactly. keep on winning they keep they keep winning yeah. i'll use this as a segue for you shane like i said you, you built three mines i'm very curious at this point in your career what turned your head about West Red Lake Gold? What about this opportunity convinced you to join the team and take this project on? Really, it, it, it's again, it's about experience and, and over, over 25 years of building, operating, working in mines, just understanding the process, understanding from early stage, building how long it takes to build out a company. You know, you have resource development, you have resource, you have engineering studies, you have permitting, you have construction. That's a long runway. So really, this opportunity came along and that you have to spend a lot of money to do that as your investors you know, a lot of dilution, a lot of raising money. It's, it's a long slog, really. And so what, what really interests me about Red, West Red Lake and the story was that it was all there. You know, it's all there. Infrastructure has been put in place. Permits are in place. It, uh, they've raised the money. They were in commercial production. Now, they had some challenges, but it's very... Uh, unusual to have an opportunity like that ready to go. So from, if I go back to our discussion on cyclicality of the gold market, timing of mining projects, they're lining up very well. A lot of people obviously were in the gold market believe that the time is coming up for gold. So you need to be ready to go on that opportunity. And the best way to leverage gold prices is to build a gold mining company over time. Mm. Now, if you were to go back and wait seven years to do that, you might miss the market. So we target an opportunity that was near term. So as that gold market is rising, we can be growing a company and building production. And that's really the timing issue we've talked about. You can't, you can't un predict timing, but you can set yourself up to be, if it does come, you're ready to go. And that's really what intrigued me about uh, the West Red Lake story, that I could get a project that I've been building for 20 years, ready to go into production. Right. Now, that's a real opportunity. And when you say it was all there, I mean, we're obviously referring to the Madsen mine, which is a project that was literally taken to the 99th yard line. And, and then the ball was fumbled. Yeah. And that, you call it rare, I mean, that may have never happened in this same context before. Typically, if you get a project that far and then something bad happens, isn't it normally jurisdiction, right? The government gets involved if you're in a sketchy location. That's not what happened here, right? It was, you know, a series of unfortunate mistakes made by management. They got into some, fi some financial trouble, right? And had to rel relinquish the project. Yeah, so normally, as you say, projects fail for a couple of reasons. Political risk is obviously ongoing, very relevant today in today's market, yeah. or there's some technical challenges. So if you have a technical challenges, they're difficult to fix. And you, if you have political issues, they're very difficult to fix. Right. One of the things that I saw when I went in and had a look at this is there were some management failings. And that's the easiest solution to solve of those three issues. Right. And so hmm. my experience of building these is more about bringing the team forward and empowering the team and building the team. and. They had been through that and they very understood the challenges. And so that's an easy solution. If you can build teams and you're good at building teams and organizations, that's an easy solution to solve. And that's what I liked about it, those elements. They didn't really, they got in, they had COVID hit them as well. You know, COVID affected every mine as well. Yeah. So these are issues that were, you know, were, are solvable yeah. and do that. And th with that, with the infrastructure that was in place, obviously we have the backers, Frank Deuster and the team. And so all those together created a huge opportunity that I was just jumping into. I saw the opportunity. That's right. Yeah. And a actually, as Frank Deuster said, the mill on site still has that new car smell. That's how new all the infrastructure is, it's, right? It's, 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 when you go there on site, we've done a couple of videos. Your viewers can see it on our website. It's just amazing to get a project like that. And, you know, we got it so cheap relative to, we talked about value versus price. We got it so cheap for that infrastructure. I, I joked to Frank, we were on site and there's a water treatment plant there. And I've put in those sort of water treatment treatment plants at the end of the mine and the value we paid the water treatment plant is worth that value and I said you got a water treatment plant everything else came for free right you know so that's the kind of opportunity that's there 
And can you can you walk us through the transaction specifically exactly for anybody who's never seen it before? I mean, a lot of my audience will because I was a shareholder of that company that fumbled the ball at the yeah. 99th yard line. I was there for the whole ride. So many of my viewers were too. And that's why I'm so excited to bring this back with yeah. new management yeah. because as you said, p changing the people is easy. It's a lot easier than changing the geology, yeah. right? So we can yeah. fix people problems. Uh, walk my audience through the transaction in specifics. What did you buy? Why? was it such great value? Why does Frank Justra call this a deal like none other he's ever seen in his career? Yeah, and, and Frank, just to step back a bit, Frank has been doing this a long time. He's one of seriously successful, he's built a lot of big companies. And so for Frank to say, this is the deal he, he saw best ever, that's a big deal. He's been through a lot, you know, he's seen a lot. It's not like me saying it, you know, it's, sure. it's Frank saying it. He's built a lot of companies. So look, the. Uh, it was pure gold was the maths in mind before that they were the group they were the company they were darlings of the stock market you know they, they oh, yeah they that was the up, next great canadian gold story in gold 2020 story, they ran yeah. up the value went right up to i think it was 1.2 billion dollars actually that's right that you know and so the market understood the potential of the project the opportunity unfortunately so when you look at that and also this there's been 350 million dollars of capital put into this mine. So $350 million, that's a lot of capital today. There's a mill in place, there's an underground shaft, there's water treatment, there's everything there that you need for a mine. I would say if you had to build that today as a green field early stage, and some of your viewers will be aware of there's Cote Gold, there's big mines being built out there, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars to get these mines up and running. If you had to build what we have today, I would say today well over a half a billion dollars to right. put from a green field story. So we have all that in place. And so that value alone, we've paid, we paid six and a half million dollars Canadian for that and a 1% NSR and some, uh, some contingent payments. So consideration 30, 35 million altogether when you take the value of shares. Sprott were the resource, Sprott resource lending were the, were the senior secure lender. Yep. And we converted all them into shares in West Red Lake. So when you take the value of the shares, the NSR and the value, 30, 35 million dollars kind of overall. Mm -hmm. So when you look at that, it's 10 cents on a dollar effectively, you know? Yeah. It gives you that sort of value is inherent in that project, you know? And good context when you mentioned $1.2 billion valuation in the last gold bull market, that was the market value, the, the value the market put on this project in the last bull market. And what's the value today? So today uh, the value of the company is 150 million Canadian dollars. Okay, so you could speculate a bull market, right? We saw a $1.2 billion valuation on the same asset, the same although you're asset. further down the path a little bit. So walk me through your, your process now. What are you going to do with the Madsen mine? What's the, what's the near-term and long-term plan here, Shane? Yeah, as you said, they, 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 f they fumbled at the 99 yard. And so we saw that very clearly, and we saw some really issues that they just didn't get right. And so, like I said, they got all the surface facilities right, they got all the infrastructure, they got the permitting done. But these mines in Red Lake, I don't know how much your viewers know, but they're very, very high grade, but they're geologically a little bit complex. And it needs time and effort to get in underground, drill these out, spend the time and effort. Now, the opportunity of that is if you do that, like, you can uncover some gems on there. Your viewers will probably know the original Red Lake mine that uh, uh, Rob McEwen built and then you had Gold Corp and it was a huge they found a high grade zone so it needs time it needs underground drilling it needs development and that was one area that we identified that hadn't been done to the level that was required just from our experience my experience and understanding so that's going to be our focus over the next while we need to de-risk the other thing is as you said the perception that's out there around this asset yeah. we need to prove to the market that that perception is not there anymore. So it's going to take time. It's going to take time, effort. It's yeah. kind of this, as we talked about the gold mine, it's this slow build and build up that, show the market that we know what we're doing. We've taken this over. We're going to take our time. And as we do these stages through, we'll end up with a successful project. And that's our plan now, to go underground. We have teams, I was up there this week. We have 100 people on site at the moment already. Mm. We only got the asset in June of last year, and there was nobody there at that stage. We've ramped back up, we've gone underground, we're developing, we're drilling underground. So we're up to 100 people now working, and they're 
working on the success to turn around the mine, drilling underground, doing that definition drilling, putting together the underground development and really de-risking the project as, as, as what's needed to move forward. How has that headwind been to deal with? Because you're right, the market experienced this asset with the previous company, ran into the headwinds like myself. Yeah. I was yeah. one of those yeah. shareholders, right? So, you know, I've made up my mind about how I feel about it, right? The rocks haven't changed. That's how I feel. But you're fighting that battle. What's that been like? Has there been much friction or headwinds? Has it been a struggle to explain, look, we've rewrapped this thing, brand new operators, brand new management. It's, you know, it's a new take on a great asset. That's what you should focus on. But what's that, what's that process been well, like? I love that challenge. I love that okay. challenge because because everybody I speak to, it's like some people say, I never want to hear that asset again. Mm. You know what I mean? Because remember, when it got very frothy and up, as you well know, some of the retail come in very late to the story. Yeah. You know? So at the peak, a lot of them were, were jumping in and they were the ones that got burned. The institutions came in early and they were out. They're just the smart money. But unfortunately, a lot of retail came in on, on that wave and at the peak when the fraudiness was there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them, they were wiped out effectively. So a lot of people I talk to say, look, I don't want to see that asset again. But when I sit back and, as you say, like we're doing now, walk through the steps of what we're trying to do, what we're planning to do, how we're going to de-risk this, the team we have in place, the backers, the board, you know, they get it. They begin to understand and go, wow, this is, this is, we believe in this now. And I'm converting slowly some of the existing shareholders back into West Red Lake. There's an opportunity to average down. Effectively. I'm one of them. Yeah. yeah. So we're building that momentum. And it's, look, we're getting good momentum. I, I believe we're beginning to convert them over. They're seeing what we're doing. We're getting some very good exploration results. Yeah. New areas within the mine. And, you know, it'll take some time. It takes some time. But again, if you get that gold market that we believe is coming, we will be probably at that stage one of the only projects that close to production. So I want to pull on that thread a little bit. You know, Pure Gold had the mine in commercial production prior to running into problems. What's your timeline to get back to commercial pro production? And then, you know, you, you said it already to a degree, but what are you going to do differently? Why is it different this time? I just want to give you the opportunity yeah. to answer that question specifically. Well, one of the keys we saw when we went in and looked at it is, you know, they had all the challenges early on, but just near the end, unfortunately, they brought in some very good people. They knew they had some challenges. They brought in some very good people. And those people were key. They began to turn around that situation. So we could see in the last six, seven months before we would, the people were beginning to turn around. They were beginning to get into the good ore. They were beginning to get the production up. They were beginning the last three months before they went under. They were actually good production numbers. There was good grip. So we could see, as you said, they were just at the 99 yard. They were ready to go. Yeah. I believe with another, you know, another six months and some more money and capital injection at that time, mm -hmm. they would, we it wouldn't have that. Very money. close. They very were close. very close. Yeah. And the key for me was they brought in some good people who I know are very good mind builders, underground development. It took them a long time to pivot to that. But once they got that, they began to turn the ship around. And mm. unfortunately, they ran out of time. Just at that stage, COVID hit them. So yeah. it was like the last smack that yeah. killed them, really. Yeah. And that that was unfortunate. Reduced so we, the visibility management had on the projects. Exactly. And they couldn't get, look, there was, it's a ramp up. So COVID, you need spare parts, you need new people, you need everything. That affected every mine in the world. Never mind in a ramp up. It's pretty challenging to do. Yeah. And so so we saw that, but, but they were nearly there. So we that's what we saw. They were there. That gives us the opportunity to take it on and bring it the next level. Mm. So. Now, look, I've, I've watched some interviews from uh, many of your team on site just talking about the culture shifts that's occurred on site uh, yeah. since you guys taken over and how enthusiastic the team is to bring this thing back to production. So what's that been like? Because you've taken over some old team members, brought in your own, and you've got to merge that a little bit. So this is a real, I, I love this area because my, I like building teams and re-motivating teams and building out teams and big companies. And so what, what we went as we went in there was there was some key people left over. A lot of the original people were let go and, and went through care and maintenance. And there was some key people up there that we identified and the, the, the Sprott who were the main, um, the main holders of the asset as a senior secured lender. They actually, in fairness, they identified some of the key people and they kept them in place. And so when we went in, we saw the value of those people. And really it was about, they've been through a process. They went through care and maintenance. They saw all their 
their colleagues were let go, there was issues with payments. In the town, Pure Gold left a lot of suppliers as well with no, with in the lurch. So there was a I lot see. of history, there was a lot of bad blood in the town. And that's what I like, it's, it's about converting that around into new energy, a new focus. And, and we spent a lot of time doing that. And we worked with the communities, we, we, we paid off our, the debts that were there. We got the people around the new, the new plan, the new motivation. And they've come around and they've learned, which for me is the most important, is building these minds about learning from the lessons and the failings. You know, we're not bringing anything new. The more important thing is we're bringing a new energy, a new focus, but we're more important we're learning from the team. Mm. They know what the failures were. They know what went wrong. And we can harness that energy and bring it forward. That's, that's the key to success, in my opinion. And they, they kind of knew what they needed to do. You know, they knew what they needed to do. They just weren't getting the support, the opportunity to bring that out. And so we, if we can bring that out and focus that, then I think we'll get very successful. Yep. Like I said to you earlier, Earlier. I've built the Mac mine very successfully for El Dorado and we built that from early stage to full production in 18 months. I was down there with the team and again the team were energetic, they were focused, part of my job was to build them up and I see that same sort of energy down at the site now. They're rejuvenated, they're refocused and that gives me a lot of confidence that we will be successful this time around. I know? love that. Yeah, set the vision, gather the best people in the world, and then get out of their way. And let them do their job. Empower them to do their job. And, and that, a lot of people don't get that. I mean, that's a lot of what at the executive level. We as an executive corporate should work for the site, not the other way around. They shouldn't work for us. A lot of executives in corporate feel that, well, the sites are working for them and they need to perform and everything. Mm. I see a different approach. I see our job as executive corporate team to support them, to help them be successful. That's part of our role, and that's what I like to do, and I've had very good success with that, and that's what I think is the, the success of, of the companies I've built, and so that's part of our job. We're down there this week promoting them, giving them ideas, helping them give their vision. A lot of them know what to do. You know, it's not mm. about, it's not like they don't know what to do. They know what to do, but you need to give them that space to rise, and that's part of it. So, so I know you've also been busy at your Rowan projects, yep. and I'd love you to share what else is going on within West Red Lake Gold that's increasing the net asset value of the company. Yeah, so, you know, we have another project, Rowan, which was the first opportunity in Red Lake we took over. Yeah. That is a, a very good project. It has 800,000 ounces at, at around 9 grams, which is high-grade ore body in Red Lake. It's, there's a lot of around Red Lake, there's a lot of ore bodies that are high-grade. They're probably not big enough to justify, you know, their own mill, their own infrastructure, their own facilities. Okay. However, we're the only group now, and this is part of our strategy. We're the only group, the independent group there. We have Evolution, who have the big Red Lake mine, and you, you have Great Bear, who used to be Great Bear, now being bought by Kinross. So we're the only independent have our own mill there. Mm -hmm. So that gives us the opportunity to create this hub and spoke model, yeah. where we can consolidate a number of these deposits, including Rowan, use that, and, and be feeders for our mill. So we can expand our mill, expand and grow the business. That hub and spoke model, it's popular in other countries, not so much in Canada, but it gives us a unique opportunity to build a number of that around our mill. We can expand our mill, our facilities, and use these facilities to draw in, which gives you a much higher grade because you can sweeten with the grade. You don't need a lot of production. The yeah. Natsin will be the base mine with the main production and everything, but if you can bring in higher grade material, then you can sweeten the, the, the grade, bring it up, and that, that'll be overall. Also from a risk mitigation, the Pure Gold team had only Madsen and they had one area of Madsen. So they, they had to live and buy whether that is successful. Mining is a risky game. You need to be risk management. So from a strategy like that, you'll have a number of production centers which lower your risk of your ability to be successful. So these are some of the strategies we're using to mitigate the risk. And within the ore body, there's a number of different areas. So you could you can see a sort of a a number of production centers feeding this central area, which reduces your risk, which gives you the opportunity to focus and maximize the grade yep. and coordinate within that. And that's really the, the strategy we've used going in there to build out the company. Yeah, lots of optionality. Optionality is the key. Underground mining, as you know, it has its risks, it has its challenges. The key thing to manage that is optionality, the ability right. to pivot, the ability to change. And if you don't and you're stuck in one area, if it fails or if there's some issues, 
then you're in trouble. You're really, and that's really, the team went into an area called the McVeigh zone, which was the original area they went in. Yeah. And I understand why it was close to the mill. It didn't, it's not deep down in the system. It was easy development. If you want to show production quickly, it's the right area to go. But it was more geologically complex than they thought. There was some challenges there. And so, you know, that failed. If that fails, you're in trouble. They know where to pivot. Yeah. Whereas having That's as right. a strategy, a number of con production areas, not our opportunities, it gives you to spin and be able to adapt. And adaptability, as you talk about a lot, is, is the key to success in the changing environment. And no different in mining. In any business, exactly. Any business. No different in no, mining. No you know, what's, in mining. What's plan C? That's what I want to know before exactly. I write a check. And right? the big successful entrepreneurs in mining, they have they build our companies up over that diversification, number of different cup operations, number of different companies. It's kind of like, and, and, and once, once you have that, we're looking, obviously with the backing of Frank and the group, to build another Gold Corp. Now, Gold Corp was a big company and it's a big ambition, but Frank has big ambitions. And the idea is to get Madsen going and use that as a base to build a large company. So walk me through that vision a little bit. And even just inside of 2024, core priorities, maybe start with cash position. Are you going to be going back to the market? What does that look like? Yeah, sure. we, we, we have about $12 million at the moment. Last year, um, actually the company just won the TSX 50, the top mining company in, in, in a TSX fee, which is a big deal given the markets, as you well know. So last year we, oh, yeah. we, you know, the markets are pretty down to go on markets, especially for juniors and developers. But we raised over $50 million last year. It was probably 50 more than most of our peers yeah. really in today's market. Yeah. So we have, with the backers we have, the team we have, we're getting that market support. So we, we have to raise more money as we go forward and build that. But I'm quite confident that will be not a problem for the company with the backers we have and the team we have yeah. as we develop that in. So that's kind of there. Well, the office that you're located, right, there's a handful of companies that have been able to raise far more money than their peers over the last 24 months. Yeah, and, and really, like I said, a number, Frank and the team were out of money for a long time, Gold Corp, and Frank was building Lionsgate Entertainment, you yeah. know, movie companies. Yeah. But in the last number of years, he sees the setup for commodities and gold. He's back you know, in a big he's way. He's back in a big way, and yeah. look, Frank is good at timing. The last bull, right. he, did, he built a lot of companies over that time. Yeah. And so he's back in and building that structure and building that understanding and that teams, building the teams and opportunities. And that gives the support from a wider group. You just spoke to a colleague of mine. He has a company. There's about four or five different companies in there. And there's a good group of, there's probably 45 people in our office now, engineers, um, geologists, finance people. And that gives you a, a platform to build upon. And, and there's no... There's a lot of synergies between the group. There's no one company versus the other. We're all working together. And pooling Sean, resources. Pooling resources together. Beneficial. Some people are good at, Sean is good at raising the money and opportunities. Frank is good at the opportunity. I'm good in the production and operations. So when you get that together, it gives you a lot of synergies and it's all helping each company. And that's, that's very unique for me that I've seen in, in the mine industry, but it's very powerful when it's successful. Yeah. Look, Shane, I, I want to thank you for coming on and, and chatting with me today. It's been great getting your perspective on this asset because, as I said, it was one that I was quite close to from 2018, 2019, 2020. And, um, you know, I've had you on before to get your thoughts on the new plan, yeah. right? New packaging, great asset, new management, right? The sky's the limit here. So um, I appreciate your time today. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Jay. It's great right. to be on.